What's up? Welcome to another episode of Help with Natalie Cuomo. I'm Natalie, I guess, and I am here today. I'm actually in such a good mood. It's it's so crazy because like yesterday, it's it's yesterday. I just feel like everything happened all at once, and I feel like good things are just starting to happen to me finally, and I'm feeling really good. I'm in studio with two awesome guests. I'm here with the amazing comedians, Matthew Rossard and Aaliyah Janine. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm good, despite it's the worst weather I've ever uh, experienced in my life. It's oh, it's not that bad. 38. And I biked here, so. Oh. No. <laughs> if it had been colder, at least the ice wouldn't have melted on my face. Like, yes. that was one of those days. It's yeah. just like slush falling yes. from the sky. Yes. yes. Just you a, biked here? I biked, No, I biked six minutes from the train. Okay. Which is what it, they did the city bike from the train. Wow. Yeah. That's rough. Which was stupid. Which was very stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yes. would say. Yes. But that's okay. You got your you got your uh exercise in. Yeah. That's important. Right? I had nice warm uh boat shoes with no socks. So that was very uh that was a very good That's decision. a very March out outfit because you never know what to wear. You're like, I'm gonna wear this winter jacket, but shorts as well, because you don't know what it's gonna be. Yeah, it's a frenetic month. Yes. Man, yes. I am really excited to have you guys. Thanks for having us. You are both hilarious comedians, and you're both people that I want to ask help from. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm also, it's getting hot in here. You're both very attractive, and now I'm regretting my decision to wear a long sleeve shirt because it's hot now. Not because of you, but it's hot. I mean, we are hot. It's it's hot. I mean, okay. <sighs> All right. I like to start the fire. It's hot. It's warm, but I can still appreciate it as my fingers regain circulation. Yeah. Maybe I'll hate it in 10 minutes. I'm not going through menopause yet, so I'm cool. Um, man, I've just, I've, I'm really starting to feel good. Like, I feel like this podcast has, like, tracked my, my mental health in a way yeah. that's very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Because basically it's me, like, asking the best advice you have ever received. And I'm very transparent about everything that I'm going through. And I'm really happy that today I'm feeling good. What was the turnaround? <laughs> yeah. The turnaround would probably be um, getting out of a toxic situation and then putting that energy into myself. That always makes you feel better. It feels hundred percent. Like it feels like I it feels like a bottle with a cork in it. Mm -hmm. And then like you took the cork out of the bottle and you're like, oh shit. There's there's room to grow. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited. Um, I do like to start asking the best advice you ever received. Matthew, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, my One of my best friends and roommates in L.A. Uh, named Johnny Montgomery. I met his dad, who was thoroughly unimpressed by me as we went out for lunch. <laughs> and then I told a story about bombing. And he goes, uh, isn't it funny that when you talk about your failures, you seem so much more interesting. <laughs> and I was, I was just a good, I, you're, talking about your failures is, is more endearing than talking about your successes, even though that's kind of counterintuitive. The, the, the more vulnerability you show, the, the stronger you can sometimes seem. So. Wow, and that's like an, an interesting thing for you to say to me today. Yeah? Because I'm just saying, wow, I feel like I'm, I'm overcoming some failures. Yeah, you don't sound like a rapper. Well, that's anything. the point of it is that, like, because people are more interested in your growth, to see your growth. Because if you already succeeded, they're like, yay, well, what else do you have? Especially right. now, every three minutes, you need to come up with something new. That's true. Yeah. It's, it's true. People don't want to hear you say that you're succeeding in anything no. either. People never want to hear no. that. <laughs> never. Really, you know what I love is the fitness influencers who post like body transformations and you can't see the difference because they were too ripped to begin with. Right, yeah. yeah. And you're it's just like, like, what is that? Yeah. You have an extra ab now? Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely cannot follow any fitness influencers, anyone that posts shit like that. I, I can't. No. I don't want to see that. Well, that's the only way I can like uh, check out women online. <laughs> Because if I just looked at just crazy. booty pictures, my girlfriend was like, what's that? But I'm like, no, it's a workout. Like, it's a really good workout. See? Yeah, look, it's a great uh, glute activation. That's why I'm looking at it. Yeah. Do you do that? Do you follow fitness influencers? Um, <laughs> I follow just a couple, but then my Explore page is just loaded with them. Well, That's yeah, you like one them. picture and then it's yeah. over. I follow Aaron Berg. That's my um, exercise person. <laughs> Physical uh, well-being, yeah. mental, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Healthy diet, toxic, uh, toxic language. Do you? My favorite. Yeah. 
it's interesting because everyone says like if you work out it'll clear up your mind it does actually help out tremendously i've been taking kickboxing classes for like the past year and i don't get as angry as often and also meditating helps it's like i still want to stab people but like the rage is gone stuff like i'm gonna fucking kill you it's now like i could stab you do you, do you save the rage for kickboxing class? Yeah. 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 Oh, God. Yeah. It's great. I mean, I fucked up my wrist, but <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. Who were you thinking about when you fucked Literally up? Literally everybody. Nice. I'm not a fan of people. That, like, you guys are cool, but like outside, <laughs> I'm not a fan of people. Do you imagine people's faces? Sometimes, yeah. Absolutely. Ex boyfriends, like shitty friends, that kind of thing. Does it make you angrier? No, I guess no. Th like the frame of mind. Normally, if I'm just sitting at home, like overthinking, which I love to do as well, that will make me like very angry. But like getting it out, like physically actually really does help like clear up your head and also gives you happy chemicals, hmm. which I need a lot of those. Me too. Yeah, I'm a believer that exercise can be very, very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. a, it's like the only rush of good chemicals that doesn't have a crash. Yeah, yeah. You know, coffee. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop in four hours. Or Adderall. I'm gonna cry in eight. Yeah, it's ecstasy. You're gonna be depressed for three days. Three. Yeah. If minimum. Minimum. <laughs> so I'm curious about what your piece of advice. I still want to go back to this. Mm -hmm. What was, what prompted him to say this? Like, I know you were telling a story about you bombing, but what, like, what was the circumstance, and like, why is that? something that you take as the best advice you ever received and like how how have you kind of like put that in your life yeah i guess it's more it's it's maybe like a more niche thing for me that i apply to comedy but it was uh i i can come off as arrogant whether or not i am or not and learning that people that it disarms people and it, it's th something i can use when i when i write jokes I always look for a place of vulnerability is usually a really great place to start a story or a joke from uh, and then just talking to people, it's a very disarming thing. Just in conversation, it's, I'm Jewish. Jews do it really well. <laughs> Jews are always like, oh, I have a small penis. Look at this guy <laughs> with his big penis. And then they land a sales contractor and, you know, <laughs> and solve a legal case. So okay. it's, just a, it's just a good interpersonal. I don't mean to manipulate people with it, but uh, it's, it's, it just helps me connect with people. That's in a, a manipulative way. No, yeah. just kidding. In a what way? In a manipulative yes, way. Yes, yes. It lets people be dough in my hands to, yeah. to do what just I want to with. Just to mold and shape them into who I want them to be. Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you feel like that aligns with like some truth? Do you have a self-deprecating like thought process, or do you have to be like, all right, I need to kind of like? Oh, it's. I don't think it's ingenuine. I do spend a lot of time tearing myself down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're uh, a comedian. Yeah, I have the demons. Yes, and. Uh, it also, it's also therapeutic to just, once you get an insecurity out there, it kind of no longer has power over you. It's kind of, the things that trouble you the most are the things you're unsure of. Like, am I this? I don't know if I'm, I'm bad at this. And then once you, like, right. once I accept it, oh, I'm bad at dancing. <laughs> oh, I'm not insecure about that anymore because mm -hmm. I was wondering if I was bad, but now that I know I'm bad, it doesn't hurt as much. Yeah, it's the self-realization yeah. that helps a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Matthew is one of the most, like you are one of the most brilliant joke writers. Like, Oh, I appreciate that. Really, have you, I, I don't know if I, anyone watching has seen Matthew, you are such a brilliant joke writer. What is your process of writing a joke? Like what, how does that, I know that's the worst question and people <laughs> ask that and you're just like, I don't fucking know how I, like you do, but you don't. What is your, what is your process of working on a joke? Every time I see you on stage, I'm just like, that's fucking smart. Oh, um, this is not revolutionary. My process is it's way more about editing. It's way more about what you cut out. I write more bad jokes <laughs> than anyone. I write, I pride my, my, my uh, like notepad on Google Drive for writing just as bad ideas to remind myself that you're not, you don't need to write good jokes, get the bad ones out of the way, and your job is to shuffle through a thousand bad jokes to find one that's okay, mm -hmm. and then having the ear to listen to the crowd and be like, okay, that got a laugh. But was it a big laugh? No. If I cut it, would it make the next joke mm -hmm. pop harder? Then do that, and then just condense and condense and condense, and then that that process is very. Uh, it hurts because you realize <laughs> most ideas are such garbage. Yeah, it does uh, hurt. It hurts so bad. There's a great Ira Glass quote about that. I recommend looking up. Seinfeld did an episode of Tim Ferriss's podcast that was all about how it's not about the quality; it's about the output, and and then just just cutting, paring down. Aaliyah, what would you say? Aaliyah's all like, what would you say is your 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 writing process? 
Oh, because I write a lot. I do a lot of free writing. Like right, I'll sit smart. down for like 10 minutes and then I just write down like paragraphs a lot of times or typing. Typing, I could get out more. Um, and then, like he said, just chopping down to where you just have like maybe only like three little ideas or mm. one idea or something and then just building on that and then chopping it down. It's basically it's like two steps forward, three steps back kind of thing where you just go until you have the final product. And one of the things I love about your comedy, Ilya, you're so fucking funny. And one of the things I love is that you you embrace like all of the things that people say about women in comedy. You're like they're like, ah, oh, you're just using your sexuality. Like people say this shit to me all the time. Mm -hmm. You fucking embrace that. You take it and you're like, I am going to fucking make all of this shit fucking hilarious. Yeah. I'm going to make it funny and I'm just going to use it. I'm not going to hide from it. And I like I was dying watching your set at Route 66. <laughs> like you were fucking hilarious. You. you crushed it. And I love the, the joke about like your dad being a hitman. I just like yeah. want to know everything about your life. I just want <laughs> you to keep telling me more. Like how do you draw the line between like being personal on stage and like kind of like where do you draw the line? How personal are you on stage with your set? How much mm. of it is true? Like. How do you craft your jokes that way? Um, a lot of it does come from a place of truth. Obviously, like my father was allegedly a hitman. Um, my uncle also was a national enforcer for the biker gang, the outlaws. So Whoa. like I grew up around a lot of very dangerous, crazy people, basically. <laughs> and um, so I wanted to be able to use that. Like I never really talked about it because I was always afraid that like I could get killed. And um, <laughs> that is actually a big factor, especially when it comes um, with like biker clubs and stuff like that. And, and, you know, like they fight, but I also have an uncle on my f mother's side who was in the hell's angel. So I kind of feel like I'm the white class Juliet, like white trash <laughs> Juliet. You know what I mean? Just like stuck in the Montague. middle. Yeah. yeah. Either that or like an abomination and I need to die. Um, I can relate. My dad was an avid cyclist. So uh, I yeah. <laughs> a lot of bikers. Yeah, the bikers are crazy with their outfits and stuff. Mm -hmm. They always like to match. Yep. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I do like to do that. And I do like to try to make the darker things like like funny about like, like being, you know, a retired porn star and, and growing up, you know, with criminals and, and stuff like that. And, and trying to make it funny because a lot of it's funny to me because I've healed from it. Right. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So I'm healed from it. But a lot of times when I tell like specific jokes... Um, people are really interested. They're just like, holy fuck. And I'm like, okay, well, they laughed here and they laughed here. And now I just need to work on like getting more laughs out of this crazy situation that are I call my life. Are there parts of it that get laughs that you don't expect to get laughs? Yeah, just, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. The first time, it was so dumb to do this too. It's when I opened up for Big J um, in Milwaukee, but I'm from Milwaukee. So I was like, oh, this is the perfect place because these are my people. And so I did all these jokes about, you know, my dad and my uncle, you know, going to prison for manslaughter too and like being in the biker gang and possibly being a serial killer, you know, according to my mother. And, um... Yeah, I maybe shouldn't have done that, <laughs> but it, it was great because I had 20 minutes. I'm like, fuck it. I'm just going to work this shit out. And yeah, so like I re-listened to the tapes and a lot of them, I was always just checking out the audience. I'm like, are you guys okay? Like, is this, is this all right? Are you guys scared of me? I'm like, if you guys don't laugh, I'm going to call my dad kind of stuff, um, which was funny. That one actually got a laugh. I'm like, all right, mental note to keep that. <laughs> yep, the crowd tells you everything. Yeah. You know, I always feel like the audience is like audiences are dumb but they're also so fucking smart like yeah they know if you've healed from a situation or not like mm -hmm. i like i always like i want to joke about a breakup i want to joke about something that i have trauma about but they know if you've healed from it yeah like even they if you, even if you it. think that you have but you haven't like that's when you get like a aw is if mm -hmm. you haven't healed from it yet yeah. and you're joking about it so that's why i feel like that's that's so like smart to know that like all right i've healed from this so i can talk about it even though it's really dark yeah i can talk about it and like explore how to make it funny because i this is part of my past yeah you know what i fucking hate is in every stand-up tv show or movie a comic has been doing the same set that they're unenthused about and then they have some big traumatic event and they go on stage and they just talk about it and it kills no it fucking <laughs> doesn't it still takes a year to work out right. if not more yeah it's not it no takes the, so long. It's like so long. Maybe take Nataro that one time, but 
I, st- I would still love to hear her work on that material for another 12 months because it's only going to get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on top of that, I feel like there's so many times where, okay, maybe that first time you go up and you do it, but you- try doing it a month from now when you don't have that energy behind it of it just happening. Mm-hmm. It's going to fall flat unless you have that sharpness to the writing. Yeah. What's, uh, yeah. Tone, you- how you feel. Like a lot of it too is how you feel about it because there's certain jokes that I know that kill, but like if I'm not in the mood to tell those specific ones, then yeah, they don't do as well as they normally do. Yeah, unless you have like the writing behind it to back it yeah, up and you can like writing. trust it, I almost feel. Can I ask a question mm-hmm. that uh, maybe you've been asked this a billion it's times, okay. but your previous performance background didn't mm-hmm. inform your current performance abilities or? Um, oh yeah, no, like performing, well, I, I said like porn and stripping was always like being physically naked where comedy is being mentally naked. And mm. that's way more terrifying than being physically naked. <laughs> I have always felt, I feel way more, more terrifying. I feel, everyone's got titties, they're just different sizes, you know what I mean? <laughs> I feel completely the same way. Like I've done a nude shoot, I have a nude magazine out there yeah. and like, I have always said, like, it is so much more fucking vulnerable to post a stand-up clip than the fact that there's a three-foot banner of my tits in a bunch of people's garages right now. 100%. Yeah. Because that's my fucking heart. Mm-hmm. Okay? Like, I, like that's my yeah. heart. And these are my tits. Yeah. I've performed in my underwear. That's the closest. Yeah. Oh, I've like, done, like, naked roasts. I'm like, I own this shit. Like, this is fine for me. <laughs> I could, and you'd be like, ah, oh, that new joke didn't work. <laughs> You're watching the video back. Like, ah, just really disappointed. <laughs> Aaliyah, I would love to know, before we move further, okay. what is the best piece of advice you have ever received? Uh, the best advice I have ever received um, is probably from my mother. And uh, this is actually, good. well, I guess it's right in line with me. Um, she had told me, she's like, you can do drugs, just don't let the drugs do you. <laughs> Matthew and I both looked at each other and went like that oh. actually makes a lot of sense yeah because really yeah. when I was younger obviously like I um, in high school and stuff like growing up like middle school I actually was really against like drinking drugs like I never even smoked cigarettes because my stepmother was a raging alcoholic and my dad is also um, a drug addict uh, crack and heroin. He loved all of them. Um, so just growing up with that when I was really man. young. Yeah. <laughs> did a little bit of everything. Um, I didn't want to really be a part of that. And then my teenage years, they're like, well, here, try pot. And then like I try pot. And I'm like, I really like pot. And acid. Acid was the first drug that I actually ever did that um, that I got high from. Because I smoked pot a couple of times and it never did anything. But acid was my first time ever getting fucked up and I fell in love. You still do it? Oh yeah. Isn't it great? Yeah. I do it like once a month. Yeah. Uh, Microdosing mushrooms. Yeah. That's like, I love all that stuff. So the, okay. So what's your interpretation then of not letting drugs do you? Um, well, I also really love cocaine and that, <laughs> um, and that is a really bad drug. Cause that is one that can do you where you're like, yeah. When I was, especially in my 20s, um, I, I would like I would do it by myself. I do it at work. I'm like, oh, this is the drug doing me. I'm spending like I'm more like I want to do this more than I want to live my life kind of thing. Like it's becoming a part of it. Like I still smoke, which um, I'm like, that's like my one major vice. But yeah, cocaine, I definitely try to stay away from as much as possible. But yeah, it's basically just getting addicted to drugs being end up like your father. Kind of thing. That's solid advice. Yeah. I've definitely like I will never forget when I was like uh, like probably twenty. I showed up to a f- I was the person like I showed up to a first date, and I was like I just did a line of co- I I just did a bunch of blow. How are you? <laughs> like I that was like the worst fucking thing when you show up to a first date, and I was like, do you want to do some blow? And the guy was like, okay. Um, I guess we're I guess we're gonna do this. And he's like psyching. Were you guys like, young? Yeah, I was like twenty, and like this is like not his thing. He's like, okay, like I guess. I guess well, we're new. Okay, I can do this. Like I, I, like, I will never forget, like, this poor fucking kid. <laughs> wow. Coke is fun. Coke is so fun. I've never tried it. Really? Oh, what? Wow. No, I'm pretty tame. When it comes to that. I mean, I don't of... anymore. Like, that's, yeah. that's one thing that I've, I, I haven't like, today. set up. <laughs> Nothing about yeah. Coke ever like looked appealing to me. I've, Everything I've, about it was, I'm like the chopping up the mirrors. It was so cool, especially in the 80s. Like it was so glamorous. It's sexy it, for sure. Yeah, they made it so sexy. You stay up all night, you It goes talk. up your nose, it makes you shit. You can't get an erection. Skinny! Well, how is that? <laughs> it makes There's no other hole you could have designed it for? Your nose? <laughs> 
Well, I also have ADHD, so it actually kind of helps me as long as I don't do too much. I take Adderall, so I guess I'm one to talk, but yeah. I do feel like Coke is definitely a very dangerous yeah. drug. Yeah. yeah it, I mean, it just seems to spiral out. They do, it, the, the dare thing, they're always like, you're going to die of an overdose. No, no, you're not. You're going to have a heart attack at 57. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Even if you quit, which is just way less compelling, but yeah. Yeah. It's, I had like a, uh, I had a, a leg tumor when I was like younger. I mm-hmm. never, never talk about it at all, but essentially it was poking. Have you healed from it? We can tell. Yeah, yeah we can talk about it now. <laughs> I, I, I genuinely never talk about it. It was a bone tumor and it was like oh, sticking wow. out into a bunch of like nerves. I, I genuinely never, I don't think I've ever even talked about it on this podcast, but uh, I, ha- I like remember saying to my doctor, I was like, you know, it's crazy because when I do blow, it's so much more painful. And he just looked at me and was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> because I guess because it was like sticking out into a bunch of nerves for some reason, like that would make it more painful. I don't know why, but it like was like. Vessel constriction? Or yeah. Maybe? Or yeah. Th- there's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. yeah you shouldn't yeah. be doing <laughs> cocaine. You shouldn't you be. have a tumor. <laughs> Or you should, and if it's, if it's the yeah, well, last tumor you're ever going to have, might as well have fun. <laughs> That's how I coped. <laughs> I get so it. Funny. The doctor is like, well, with this tumor, I don't recommend cocaine. Yeah. And without the tumor, I don't recommend cocaine. In 1919, maybe a little bit of cocaine. Mm. <laughs> I got addicted to nicotine in the last year. I had never smoked a cigarette in my life. That's and I say nicotine, I still haven't smoked a cigarette in my life. Oh, you're one of those vapor people. Nope. Uh, Guess again. <gasps> Chew? Chew? Guess again. Chewing gum? Zin. I did start the gum, which kind of predicated. What is it? Zin? Zin is a toothpick. No, it's it, it looks like a pouch. It's it's like it looks like a little uh, oh, uh, sugar bandit. pack. Well, that's like a chewing bandit. It's not even. It's oh. you put it in your lip, and it's just it's nicotine salt, no tobacco, which may be better for you. It may be worse for you. They're going to suppress the science as long as they can. <laughs> they have a lot of power, and I just saw it at a gas station. It's ungodly cheap it's like three bucks for a pack of 28 milligram packets eight milligrams a lot i started with three then i did six then i got to eight milligrams and then i was doing it like once a day and then i was doing it five times a day and i couldn't take a day off (laughs) and uh just just took over my life in under a year i couldn't believe how fast you could get it i mean how come no one warned me nicotine is addictive (laughs) But it's really, it, it oh, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't well, it's make, a stimulant too. It was nice. I wanted it's it when I was delight. stressed. I wanted it when I was, when I was sad. I wanted it when I was already feeling good. Mm-hmm. Like I finished the Tonight Show and my first thought was, I need to go get nicotine. That would really help. <laughs> I'm like, that's pathetic. And I, I, I've been off for like two or three weeks. Which good job. That's awesome. But it's a really hard thing to kick. Yeah. Because it's such a low barrier to entry, because you can kind of do it anywhere, anytime, and no one of them is going to kill you. It's, it's. I like the ones that kill me. Yeah. That's my favorite. Do you smoke? Yeah. 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 I've been smoking for like 26, 27 years. How I many think. a day? Um, well, I actually live in a non smoking building, so I maybe smoke like five to six cigarettes mm-hmm. a day. Uh, I have a dog, so pretty much whenever I go walk my yeah. dog kind of thing when I'm out drinking. He's an enabler. An enabler. An enabler. I had a hard time saying it because you couldn't say it. We're Those. <laughs> Those pathways, though, of like, like I can think about your mm-hmm. situation and be like, just seeing my dog excited would spur the nicotine yeah. rush. Oh, it's of a wanting habit. To walk it, it. Yeah. That's the thing is that the nicotine is out of your system because I quit a bunch and I've always quit about to like eight or nine months and then I'll, be, I'll get drunk. I'll be like, I could just have one. Yep. And it really no. is, it's like an alcoholic be like, just one and I'll be fine. And then I'm like hiding packs at the stand and then finally <laughs> taking those packs of cigarettes back home. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm a smoker again. But it's the habit. It's the stuff that, like me walking my dog, like I have my routine. So it literally becomes a part of your routine. Nicotine is out of your system in like maybe three to five days. But Mm -hmm. it's like changing those habits. And I'm like, I've done it a couple of times. But I realize, I'm like, fuck it. This is just who I am. There's smokers and non-smokers. I'm a smoker. It's 
I miss it. It's pretty wonderful. <laughs> it's a pretty wonderful little high. Yeah. As I was saying this, when I got here, literally my morning mm-hmm. was I was feeling good. I drove here. My windows were down. I was listening to Dead Mouse smoking a Camel Crush with the windows. I mm-hmm. was like, yeah, baby, turn the volume up for the drop. Like, let's go chain smoke it. If there's nothing like smoking a cigarette in your car. Oh, yeah. And, and driving. To music. Ugh. The, the only problem is I have a brand, like uh, not brand new car, but it's brand new to me. Mm-hmm. I got it in June and I've already burned a hole in one of the seats. <laughs> 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 and I'm going to be paying off this car for six years. Oh, you need to get like seat protector. I know, but it's too late. The passenger seat has a fucking hole in Put it. Put a it's... dinosaur sticker on it. Put a patch over it. Yeah. I got to do something. It's really tattoo bad. It. Like a, yeah, yeah. A tattoo. They have iron on patches you yeah. can throw on. There's something cute. Matches your style. Yeah, yeah. it's, Sad. It's like a big gaping hole oh. in the passenger seat. You can actually get that fixed. Um, they could go in and sew it. I actually could probably yeah. do it depending on how big it is. Different car places. It's you've seen it. Like Take detail it to a tailor. shops. Yeah, tailor. Take my car to the tailor. Yeah. Yeah. Be like, I have this hole. They probably could do it, honestly. How many cigarettes do you smoke a day? Um, it depends how long I'm driving. <laughs> yeah, driving. The same thing. Road trips. Yeah. Oh, it's that's... my favorite. Yeah, whenever I rent a car, I'm so excited to just smoke and drive. One to the next. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, normally it's like a joint and then a cigarette, then some soda, maybe a Mountain Dew, because I never drink that unless I'm driving kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, again, it's a routine. It's a part of my habit. The thing about the, the pouches is imagine you can do it indoors or outdoors yeah. with yeah. no one even knowing you're doing it. Yeah. You're on I would, stage. My girlfriend didn't know that I was doing that many. I would hide them, <laughs> and, and she'd, be like, she'd be like, are you on nicotine right now? I'd be like, no, see? See? And it would still be there. She just couldn't see it, and I would just... Whole day, there was usually one in my mouth for most waking hours. Were you like, babe, try it. <laughs> try it. <laughs> She's so gross. That's the one great part about it is it looks so trashy to just be spitting every uh, three minutes. Oh, God. Yeah. I used to do that. We used to chew in high school because we did like smelling like a cigarette, obviously. In mm-hmm. high school, they would bust you. So all the football players and some of the cheerleaders, we would just dip. There, like in one of the classes on the ceiling, there was just wads of chew for the football players throwing it up. So whoever sat back there, like they would play this game, like who it would fall on kind of thing. Mr. Jensen, he was so dumb. He never noticed That's, it. Ever. I was at a coffee shop in Vegas and I ran into a comic I know who I won't name, who I noticed he had a little a tobacco thing on his coffee lid, mm-hmm. a little pouch of snoo. And uh, I was like, oh, you do it? He's like, yeah. He's like, I take it out to do comedy and then I have another one back in. I'm very addicted. And then the next day we sat down again to drink coffee and he put Copenhagen, just go, go, go oh, a yeah. dollop. And then we sat there and then 45 minutes later, I'm like, wait, have you spit yet? He goes, I don't anymore. Yeah, I knew a couple of people. Oh, that's so gross. I, like, that, <laughs> like, that's like my like, uncle Dippy would make that. me like <laughs> make me sick. It's like it makes you not because it's just too much nicotine. It's just yeah. Ugh. I couldn't sculpt. That was another reason I wanted to give it up. Was my hands were too shaky, and I like to I do polymer clay sculpture, and okay. I, for the fine detail, like I was just like my dad had Parkinson's, and I felt like him. You know? Oh yeah. no. Dude, I had an uncle who used to, he would do that, but instead of chew, he would just bite a cigar and just chew. <laughs> oh, chew on the cigar? Oh, yeah, uh, a lot of dudes just chew on the cigars. I think John Borromeo's mom does that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, just eats. I think I think she was like, no, because smoking cigarettes is bad for you. So just like just Bugs Bunny, Kara, just, <laughs> you know. Oh, God. Oh, my God. It's an alternative to smoking. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys feel like there's any advice that you've been given by someone that you really respect and the advice is just absolute fucking dog shit? Most things my mom has said. (laughs) Really? (laughs) My mom told me as a, she had so many great quotes. Uh, uh, This one's maybe good. Don't tell people your shortcomings. They'll figure them out fast enough without your help. (laughs) And which is kind of true in a workplace environment. She also said direct, Depressions for people without real problems. That was a <laughs> terrible I've heard advice. That one. <laughs> yeah, that was like a mantra around the house. Oh know? my god! Not now she's now she's fully uh, supports medication and all of that. But isn't that funny how that works out? Yeah. Damn. What about you? Um, I don't know if it's the worst advice, but it was probably advice that I didn't really need. I don't know. My dad, like, he taught me a lot of things that um, after realizing. Um, I think it was just to kind of keep up the family business <laughs> kind of thing. I don't know. He just, he taught me a lot of stuff that um, I probably didn't need to know, like how to like hotwire cars and like pick locks and break into houses and how to snap a person's neck, you know, that kind of 
stuff. Is that so comforting post breakup? Um, th- knowing that I'm I could snap a man's ju- neck. I'm afraid yes. to just Google those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when you like, if someone like breaks your heart, you're like, okay, that's I could have fine. you killed. That's fine. I could kill them. Yeah. <laughs> just walk away. Cool. Yeah, I, I do love it when people online they're like, "Oh, I triggered her," and I'm like, "You're still breathing. <laughs> you haven't triggered me, sweetie." Mm. <laughs> Man, that's got to turn the volume down on most interactions. <laughs> Um, tell me, if you don't mind, a little okay. bit about your background. Oh, God. Um, well, father, obviously. Um, they used to, my dad and my uncle, they grew up in Chicago. Okay. And my grandmother used to sing at this lounge um, in Chicago that was owned by the mob. And so they used to, um, they used to like steal cars and stuff when they were really young. So they, they grew up kind of hard. And then Vietnam happened and they both. Um, we're really good at that. <laughs> um, dad went, um, dad took a different route. He actually wanted to be a criminal psychologist. Like he was a deputy sheriff in Texas for a while. Um, and then he went to study criminal psychology, which is where he met my mother who was going to school to be a registered nurse. She's been, uh, she's retired now, but she was a nurse for like over 30 years. Um, and they met in school, but he got kicked out of school for almost killing a pedophile, um, which is understandable. His heart was, was in the right place. Yeah, yeah. He just kind of snapped, uh, which happens with him sometimes. Um, so th- those are the people I kind of grew up around, my dad and my, my uncle being in the, uh, in the biker gang. There was hit out, um, put out on my mom before I was even born. She was eight months pregnant with me. Um, and it's not an abortion, uh, <laughs> but um, she was a witness to a rape that the gang had allegedly did. Uh, there was this woman. She's kind of like the club whore. They called her monkey. Um, That's what I call my dog. <laughs> well, club whore? That's monkey. a weird name for a dog. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was in nursing school, so they were... Um, <laughs> So she went to my mom to help like clean her up or whatever after <laughs> the attack. And she's like, do you want If you want to go to the cops, I can't give you a bath kind of thing. And she's like, no, no, it's fine. So my mom was the only witness kind of thing. And so um, this man, uh, his nickname was Taco. He was the president of the outlaws at the time, uh, put a hit out on my mom. I guess it was only for a couple of hours. My uncle's like, your mother over exaggerates. <laughs> uh, but that was all cleared up. Um, and then honestly, like with all the stuff going on, like my child was actually like fairly normal ish. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was shipped around a lot up until I was like school age, like from different relatives and stuff like that. I lived with my mom up until I was about seven. And then I went to go live with my dad and my stepmom. And that's actually where <laughs> I got uh, fucked up because my stepmother was really abusive. My dad was a truck driver at the time. Also serial killers. Love to drive truck. Um, yeah. Yeah. They really, sense. Yeah. Because it's super easy for them. Um, so he was gone most of the time, but she was a raging alcoholic, like a bottle of Bacardi a night type of Whoa. alcoholic. <laughs> like she was really bad. And she did not like me because I was my dad's little girl. Um, so she used to beat the fuck out of me, like just constantly. And my dad, like, what happened? I'd be so afraid, you know, obviously to say anything. Um, they got divorced when I was 14. Um, and that was, uh, I finally stood up to her <laughs> and I said, uh, she tried to like, cause she would always hit me in the face like that. I have this thing with like being touched in, in my face because of her. She went to like slap me in my face and I grabbed her hand. I'm like, you ever touch me again and I'm going to fucking kill you. And then they got a divorce and not because of that. Uh, <laughs> it'd be really cool if it was though. I'd love to see them sit down. Like, <laughs> like, it's not your fault. And you're yeah. like, damn, I wish it was. <laughs> wish it was um i had a stepbrother and a half brother a half brother passed away um i went to go live back with my mom and because um she didn't help me with my stepmom like she didn't want to believe me that she was that horrible to me even though like i would have bruises and marks all over i made her life a living hell for (laughs) for all of my high school career i barely like almost didn't graduate kind of shit just like did a bunch of drugs and was just a real fuck up Start stripping a little bit, and then uh, met a guy, quit stripping, went to school to be a cop, mm. followed in my father's footsteps. Um, well, it's funny because a, a lot of people I know look like a cop, but then become a stripper. Yeah. 
<laughs> when they it's show up at your door, you that way. They make more yeah. money that way. Trust me. <laughs> I want to stop you for a minute. Like yeah. I'm, I'm. First of all, <laughs> there's a lot of. There's so much. There's like, a lot you of footnotes know, we gotta cover. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for being so transparent and sharing <laughs> all of that. I'm so sorry that you experienced that. I. Yeah, I'm so wonderful. I mean, horrible, uh, horrible, I mean, horrible, very horrible but great content. Yeah. What is and what is something that like you wish someone told you when you were experiencing these things? Because it's like you're 14 or younger, you're stuck in the situation where like you really can't control. Like yeah. if you run away, like what do you have? Like what is something that like you wish you knew then? And what is something that would have helped you then? Like if you could talk to like there are so many people that are mm -hmm. in it's really sad there are a lot of kids that are in this position right yeah. now like what's something you wish you could say to those people um well i mean when i grew up uh, especially like 80s 90s um like beating children was just kind of a thing like now you could something would actually be done <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> a lot of times like you could go to child services and she would have been thrown in jail instantly um that there is help out there, that people do care. <laughs> I guess that people do want to, um, they don't want to see you hurt like that. And that, um, just tell somebody, because I never told anybody. Why do you think that? Now you tell everybody. Now I tell fucking everybody. Oh. Their name is Colleen. No, <laughs> why, uh, why didn't you, why do you think that you didn't tell anyone? Because I think that, yes, like, I think that makes sense. You'd say, I think a lot of people, would probably want to tell someone and want to have mm -hmm. that voice. And I think, like, what do you think held you back from saying something? Well, besides physical abuse, she was also very mentally abusive, too, right. to the point where, like, by the time I was eight years old, I was already thinking about suicide. Like, pretty much since, yeah, then it's like every day since then, I was like, oh, I could just die and the world would be a better place without me. Like, she just instilled, like, this hatred for myself kind of thing. So that... um and that no one would want to help me and no one would believe me kind of thing. So, oh, I mean, I'm fine now. <laughs> yeah, I know. But <laughs> Lots <it's>, of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so terrible. It just makes me think of like that, like this is just not, this is not a rare thing. Like, no, this is, it happens so much. This is something that like I feel that like listeners will identify with, that like people are, ex like kids are experiencing now that mm -hmm. a lot of people experience. And like, I just like, like you're not alone in that experience yeah and that's another thing too is that i i realized that i wasn't alone especially hearing some other people's stories i was like maybe mine wasn't as bad <laughs> i mean it was pretty bad but yeah there's tons of people that have extremely fucked up childhoods like that i guess yeah what's the advice that you would give uh what's the advice that you would give your younger self now don't die <laughs> <laughs> pretty much um no, that you could push through it, obviously. Um, God, it always sounds so cheesy, but like you are worth it, you know, kind of thing. I don't think that's cheesy. You don't? I think okay. that's wonderful. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> awesome. <you>. Aww. <laughs> I'm trying to make that funny. I'm like, no, now I just sound like a psychologist. It's fine, though. It doesn't have to be funny all the time. <laughs> I just feel like it, being a teenager is already a mental illness. Oh, it's it so really bad, is. yeah. Toddlers are technically, like, legalized sociopaths. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They really because, fucking are. Because they're so mean. Because, they, well, I mean, they're not mean. They're just truthful. Like, they don't have that barrier. I mean, we teach kids how to lie. Like, around that age. Be like, no, you can't say that. That's mean. That's going to hurt their feelings. Mm -hmm. But toddlers be like, you're fat, you know, kind of thing. And without and even thinking about it, they're just being honest. We teach children how to lie. Physical cruelty, just mm -hmm. sticking things in cats' butts. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom walked in and I was sticking needles into the end of Nerf darts. <laughs> and she was like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, this way it's like a real arrow. She was like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Always so violent. <laughs> yeah. You have so to learn the hard violent. way. That's why I like I don't like those playgrounds. They're all like with the rubber mats and everything's like all padded because you're not teaching kids like if you fall down, you're going to hurt yourself. Right. You fall down on a rubber mat, you bounce back up. That's why everyone's like, ah, you know, now I, I really do think that like they have um, they have this crazy playground in England where it's just like this huge fucking like dirt field and kids can start fires and there's like like tires and just like kids could like actually be kids like play in the woods like you have a little wooded area and stuff like that and they like are seriously hurt obviously they help but it's like yeah we need to have kids hurt themselves so they know not to do those things anymore 100%. that's how you learn want to learn want to hear how i learned to not play tag on the jungle gym yes, yes please. third grade i was it 
chasing someone down. They went through the jungle gym and like one of those metal, like yeah. the real deal. This is the 90s. Uh, Slipped and good fell. Ones. Just bop. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That yeah. even hurts on ladies. Yep. Our lady oh. boners. It does. To People be, think that our vaginas don't feel pain. <laughs> to be fair, it actually wasn't the testicles that hurt. It was the coccyx. It was the it was the bone impact. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it yeah. hurt very, very bad. Yeah, our pelvic areas. Oof. Well, oh, because it's the, yeah, at the very tip of your tailbone, there's this thing that's about the size of your pinky. That's yeah, just used way to be up in there. Yeah, you way back in the day. <laughs> yeah, and it's, whoo, if you break that, there's nothing they can do. Oh, just hitting it. I remember my ex, he had this chopper that didn't have any fucking suspension. And there was one time that just all the way up, felt it all the way up go on my spine. It was fucking intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. got shivers thinking about it. And I haven't played tag on the Jungle Gym since. Ever since? Have you played tag, though? Dude, I, as an adult, I would tear something instantly. The idea of like sprinting, <laughs> stopping, sprinting. There's no way my body that would stop go that. game. Remember the athleticism that athleticism of tag? Ooh. Jesus, they have like that Olympic tag now or something. Have you seen Is that, that an shit? Olympic sport? I, I don't know if it's Olympic, but it's, they need to it's make like a whole the thing where they got like a yes, timer and a course and everything. It's crazy. Do I went? I saw at a, like a strip club where they were they were all doing like the really good tricks. Mm -hmm. the, the fall all the way and then, and then grab stop, it one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the clacking. Do, they, do you have to train during the day? Do you have to like go in and like work it out? It's so <laughs> athletic. I, I never that's did. A, that's a good question. Yeah, no, it is no, actually. No, you must. It's so athletic. The core yeah. strength. Oh, God. No, I was fit as fuck when I was a dancer. Um, no, I just learned. We just learned by working. <laughs> wow. Trial and error. Turns out Aaliyah is a... you fucked it up? <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes like after work, I'd be like, oh, how do you do this one trick or whatever? And they uh -huh. show me. Yeah, there was a couple of clubs, but I'm... I'm really tall, like I'm 5'11", barefoot, so in stilettos, I'd be like 6'6", six, six sometimes, 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. So sometimes the stages would be real short, so I couldn't do a lot of tricks that I'd be hitting the ceiling and shit. Can I ask you a question, and like, I'm sorry if this comes out wrong, but with your experience in life, like... Yeah. Sex work was obviously a very... <laughs> your, do you just sometimes just feel like men, like you, men are just so pathetic that like you just can't be attracted to them sometimes yeah i mean i do date <laughs> women too but we're also fucking retarded so i know i don't disagree with what natalie said for the record <laughs> yeah. we, are. We, become, we become such animals the second oh, there's yeah. any blood in the water no there's i have seen like, a whole by other that, I mean, side nipple of poking men out. yeah, yeah. i've yes. seen an just... entire different side of men that no no one should ever have to see there's... i know your deepest darkest <laughs> secrets but i made a lot of money from knowing yeah. them so there's a level of of something that you see in people oh yeah no that... men i i'm definitely sexist men are pathetic <laughs> You get to like another level <laughs> under so, like uh, under something where it just it becomes Where'd all that evolution go? Where did <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that haven't like they haven't really evolved like socially or culturally when it comes with <laughs> what like how they treat women basically it's... and then sex in in general. And now there's just like there's no monogamy. I mean, humans aren't really built to be monogamous anyway. We're built like built to breed and then after like the toddler like when a kid becomes about like five years old, that's when like all those love chemicals and stuff kind of go away <laughs> from people and people get divorced. Statistically, it always happens around the fifth year of a child. I feel like... Interesting. I feel like... I feel like men are uh, are stupid. Okay, yeah. now do women. Yeah, do women. <laughs> do women. Women also real dumb. Okay, keep going. Wait, let's, let, what's your assessment of women? Um, I like how this podcast became like we just like we want to know <laughs> why the truth we're... from Aaliyah <laughs> why women suck <laughs> uh well we do tend to be a little bit more emotional obviously women are uh, more emotionally intelligent but we also tend to use that as a manipulation but I think that that could be evolutionary to just survive Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, men are strong. You need some power over we us. We need, yeah, yeah. So um, we kind of, that's our power is that. But we also, because um, a lot of us are um, emotionally damaged and traumatized, so we don't really know how to use it for good. Just like men don't really know how to be 100% honest with women because they're always like, oh, we're going to hurt you if we say this. When it, Obviously, we all know that it hurts more when a person lies. It's uncomfortable. Truth is uncomfortable. I like to live in the truth because I like being uncomfortable <laughs> in that. Do you think a relationship could be built around 
absolute honesty because there's so many things I well, should not lie a, about. Yeah. Oh no, it'd be like, no, honey, you look fine. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or yeah, no, obviously, like little white lies. Uh, we need them. Like mm-hmm. it's how society <laughs> survives. That's why we're not all killing each other. Like my girlfriend does not need to know my porn preferences. No, there should not be a yeah. transparent unless you're watching that... porn together. We're not. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I would. I, yeah. What is your opinion on on what? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Every, men like, versus women. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot. I cannot speak to how women interact with each other, but I think there there is decent evidence to show that women have a. Uh, congenital and uh, uh, cultural uh, emotional intelligence superiority over men. And I think because of that, they expect men to have the same uh, intelligence, and we don't. So they're talking to us with their mouths and with this little satellite dish on top of their brain, but we're not picking up those waves. Mm -hmm. And that causes them to interpret the things we do uh, as uh, uh, intentionally malicious Mm -hmm. when they're, I think, more often... Uh, inconsiderate. We just didn't consider you. I wasn't yeah. trying to make you feel bad about this. Yeah. I just wasn't thinking about it. My brain doesn't have that capacity. Mm-hmm. And I think that leads to <laughs> fights. I've I get it's both sides' faults, but yeah. that's that's most of the fights I have. Yeah. I have had this conversation on this podcast with Pat Dixon. He said something very similar mm-hmm. in the sense, and he said, like, you think it's intentional, mm-hmm. but I'm just not thinking of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and at I all. Think, and that's the problem, is that you're not thinking and I think that's what men cause pain by accident. Women cause it very on purpose. On purpose. Oh yeah, no, I'm real They're good. So at it. good at it. Yeah. yeah. When they want to. Yeah. It's and on each sp- other. Oh yeah, no, we Grudges are women. Are women. women are if women got, to each other. Yeah. If women, women got t- along more, we would rule the world. The yeah. problem to me is yeah. I think women are much worse to each other than men are to women. Mm-hmm. Women are each other's worst enemy, and it, it's actually very heartbreaking. Like, I honestly find – like, I think women have been worse to me in my life than – well. <laughs> I mean, it was nice to come for me. I don't know, but I just feel like there is there is not – I bet in comedy, in work – there's more tearing oh, each other down. Oh, it is. Like, I it, run the show, um, and it's m- majority of women, and they have, like, a group of women that um, we rotate. And the first time this other chick came on, these other two were just, like, like, one person, like, covered up her face on the flyer kind of thing. And then I had to tell them, I'm like, yo, I'm like, this is unprofessional and disrespectful. And so, th- and so when I, because I was hosting... So the next time I hosted, she both of them didn't shake my hand when I called them up kind of thing. And these are both mothers, like older women that are mothers. And I'm like, I could snap your neck. You know, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, I there is I, I told this story on my Twitch, but I, I was doing there is this girl that was like in town. Mm-hmm. I put her on my show. I was super nice to her. I've always been super nice to her. She did my show. She put me on her show and she she right before she's hosting right before she calls me on stage she goes what do you want me to say for your credit i said oh you could say new york comedy festival she goes okay she goes on stage and she goes your next comic um she's a girl and i have to say that because she's wearing baggy clothes put your hands together for natalie cuomo <laughs> i mean is that absolutely motherfucking psychotic that is insane yeah i was so angry i did three minutes and walked off the stage i because i literally walked on stage and i was like what the f- fuck did i do to you man <laughs> that is so crazy yeah that's uh, that's so crazy disregarding the cruelty never do a joke about someone bringing them up yeah. because it's not going to land because we can't see that person yeah it's just going to miss and then when the person walks on stage the crowd will go oh i see it yeah there's never gonna be a moment of laughter so why would yeah. you it's a it's like a, maybe even it's after, actually a funny constructed joke so maybe after maybe, yeah, yeah. A, and then also it like ruins my set because i'm sort Tears of just the momentum like yeah out of it your takes set. me out of my it ta- i'm just like wait like what why are you setting me up like that like mm-hmm. that's also just like and it fucks up her show like it's also like, she brought everyone up el- everyone else she brought on stage like your next comic Aaliyah Janine, she is beautiful. She's amazing. She's yeah. got a show here, and I love her. Put your hands for it. Yeah. And it's just like, wait, then why are you bringing me up a like this? Clothes. Like, this is fucking psychotic. And the audience could tell that shit, too. Yeah, because as we said, like, right. right. And it's just like, it's... And like, they're like, we want to know the drama now. We don't care about the jokes. Yeah, and I'm on stage, and I was like, that was rude. What did I do to you? And she's in the corner in the audience going, I love you, bitch. I'm like, 
<laughs> oh, that's the thing that oh, I love too is, is that now we use bitch as, as more of a friendly, like an right. endearing yeah. thing. But but there's certain ways bitch. that people say it. It's like uh-huh, like I love linguistics, like because bitch is such a fucking angry. Like you think it of the way it be, comes yeah. out. A lot of, of consonants mouth, in one syllable. Like a bitch. Yeah. That's a fucking rude ass word. Um, I like it. Uh, something I saw between two men that is I, I always laugh when I think about it uh, potluck at uh, the comedy stores on Mondays mm-hmm. are you familiar yeah mm-hmm. uh, to those who, who aren't familiar it's it's Monday night at the comedy store which is one of the best clubs in the country and on Monday all the comics come and it's you show up and you hope they pull your name and you do three minutes in front of uh, a crowd that's mostly uh, uh, judgmental comedians <laughs> yeah. and a couple of uh, stupid tourists who are, uh, and and you know it's it's your big chance to shine and the host uh, says uh, all right this next guy um I'm going to be honest, I've never seen him have a, have a good set. I've only seen him bomb. Um, doesn't mean he's not a good comic. He might have a good set right here, but I've just never seen it. And then he brought him on stage, and the guy just kind of, and then bombed. <laughs> and it was so funny. It was so funny. What a dick. What a dick. I love it. I, I do think a good, a decent comic could pull out of that situation. Yeah. Like, I would just be like, all right, low bar. You know what I mean? Just like, it's something, but he didn't even address it. Oh, yeah. That's the thing is that you have to address stuff like that. Otherwise, it it does just leave an but awkward... You have three, three minutes. Three and mi- that, yeah. like, three minutes. Not only yeah. do you have three minutes, that mic, you have to go, like... Way before show up at five thirty with the sun yeah. out, yeah. and you have to like put your name in to maybe get picked. It's a whole fucking thing to get picked to be on that uh, yeah. mic to do three minutes. So to address that is also like taking thirty seconds out of your three minute <laughs> fucking set that you planned that you plan for the entire day was That's about seventeen percent of to your do set. <laughs> That is so psychotic. Um, okay, so guys, this was so fun, and I love you both so much. I've started doing this new thing, and I know that like, what this is a little kooky, and I'm just gonna go with it. I don't know if you guys know what an oracle deck is. It's basically mm-hmm. like a tarot deck, but it's less defined. There don't have to be like specific cards. Mm-hmm. It's kind of just like more interpretive. In the interpreted it interpret interpretive. Can someone help me, please? Interpreted. Thank you. Wait, word? interpretive. Matthew? Interpretive. Thank you. That's what I meant to say. It's more interpretive. I'm the worst person to ask about words. I collect ter- serpentine, turpentine. I collect tarot and oracle decks, and basically, I have had it sitting in the room this entire time, and I just want to see if. Listen, I know you're judging me. It's okay, all right? I just want to see. Cards. I want to see. Did it ca- is this going to capture the energy of the episode? <laughs> Maybe it will. <laughs> Maybe it won't, all right? We're going to draw a card and we're going to see. And then that's how we're going to. That's how we are going to. Okay. Okay. Do you know how to clean the cards? I've never done this before. You want to do it? I would love for you to. So this deck is called. The Tarot of Personal Experience by Kyle Ranson. That's the artist. Aaliyah, I will let you okay, do the honors. So this is, we probably don't need that. I want to see a mob, like casino type movie, but about tarot cards instead of poker. So how do you clean them? Is that you, Ooh. you blow on them and then you knock. Now you shuffle them. Okay. And then you use your left hand to pick the cards. I'm learning. So I was doing it all wrong. <laughs> I'm a collector. And I don't even... That's why it wasn't working. <laughs> it, no, it worked last time, Matthew. It really did. The thing about tarot and at Oracle is it's more interpretive, so you don't even have to use your left hand. Oh. Mm. I just made that up. <laughs> um, okay. So what we're going to do is I actually want Matthew to shuffle the cards, and I want Aaliyah to pick the card. Okay. What kind of shuffle? Um, dealer's choice. Is there a way that's more? Can I? Can no, I just... shuffle anyway. I want you to have... follow your heart. My grandmother taught me how to shuffle. Because she also used to be a black card dealer. Black card oh, really? dealer. Mm-hmm. In what city? Um, can we have a shot of the. The shuffle? The shuffle. Yeah. I'm get it over and my shuffle. titties. Look at there. There you go. Look everybody. at them. <laughs> how many cards are there? Um, in this deck, mm-hmm. there are 41 cards. Bing. This was given to me as a uh, as a gift from a tattoo artist that did most of my work. And that feels good enough. Yeah. Forty one. All right. Now so I. Forty one factorial. That's a wonderful number. That's a number of possible shuffles. All right. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. I'm so nervous. It's probably going to be death. Orpheus. That makes sense. I am filled with orifices. <laughs> Fuck. 
Can you um, can you read it? <laughs> Orpheus, the hero Orpheus has two roles. One as an artist and the other as a human. His power as an artist lies in his ability to enchant worlds with music from his lyre. His songs could change the course of rivers, charm the rocks and trees, bring all the gods and nymphs to tears, and was even able to soften the heart of Hades, god of the underworld. After his wife, Eurydice, Eurydice uh, died from a snake bite, he descended to the underworld. Orpheus charmed Hades with song, allowing Eurydice to return to the world of the living on one condition, that Orpheus walked in front of her, keeping his eyes ahead until both reached the upper world once again. And it desperately human moment, his anxiety overwhelmed his compliance with Hades' proposal. He looks back at Eurydice before she exits the underworld. In a moment, she vanishes forever. Unable to accept his failure, Orpheus' grief putrefies into bitterness, and he renounces love. Fun! Wow. It's perfect. <laughs> I'm not sure. You wanted me to pick the card. As I said, sometimes it'll be on point. Sometimes it'll be an expiration. Um, Ani, what do you feel about this? At first, when he was an artist, at, among other things, I felt that we were on the right track. Mm -hmm. I felt he like was a that it's basically he was an love is stupid. That's um, that's the lesson here. There's stuff beyond love. Yeah, and that's literally everything well, else. <laughs> <laughs> love is. Can I be honest? romantic love and i'm not even trying to be like whatever it's kind of a waste like like rom-coms <laughs> and stuff like, like that. like if you put if you take that energy and you put it on yourself dude self-love what about practical love practical I'm a big love fan of practical practical love, love. Normal, yeah, partnership every day Pra like love doesn't have like I always thought that love had to be like fireworks passion marriage fucking every second no 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 that's not, no, that's what the movie, you can't believe everything you see on TV. No, let's have like, like, like partnership. Chill. Yeah. For me, that's it's just it. the notion I couldn't do better without sacrificing something else important. <laughs> I feel that every single person that has a uh, successful relationship, like year, years and years relationship, like that you ask, like what's the secret? Some or whatever. people just settle too. They a settle. Lot of times they they just it's what you're settle. settling for. Yeah, I'd I, say most people. Yeah, I don't settle. I rather be alone. Yeah, being alone's not bad. No, it's actually kind of fun. I'd rather focus on myself. Yeah. I think the moral of that story is listen to directions. <laughs> do what you're told. <laughs> Hades specifically said <laughs> not to do that. Um. All right. Well, guys. Aaliyah, Matthew, where can people find you? Uh, at Monday Punday on all platforms. Holy uh, shit, look at this card, the parent. I mean, these cards, to be honest. It's very pretty. Wait, they I are got, really cool. The cards are fucking cool. They it is cool. cool. And also, you guys, wait, I will ask you where people can find you again. Sorry, because okay. I got distracted. <laughs> if you have a cool Oracle deck, if you have a cool tarot deck, fucking message me, send it to me, anything. Like, Another reason I'm doing this is because the artwork on these things is fucking awesome. Like this shit is cool fucking cool. I you should get one tattoo. Right? Ooh, this one's fun. The, this work Rumors. is genuinely cars, is so <laughs> beautiful. Love the Fleetwood Mac album. Yeah, it's really good. One of my favorites. It's so good. Um, Talk about uh, breakups leading to good things. Oh my god! That for the fact album. that that she made him play all those songs she wrote about. Rumors. Yep. <laughs> they both did, and that's women manipulating. Have you watched the live videos where she says all of the lyrics to him with this glare? That's the one divorce where they have to pretend it's going worse than it is. Yeah. Imagine if they actually like it got out. They're like, no, actually, get along really well. Yeah, and, no, you know, we're I mean, totally yeah. fine with yeah. each other. They're like, boo, dysfunction. Look at the librarian. All of a sudden, I smell coffee. Okay, <laughs> I'm having a stroke. Matthew, m at Monday Punday on all platforms. Aaliyah, where um, can people find you? The Aaliyah Janine on Twitter, Janine on Instagram, and AaliyahJanine.com for everything else. Awesome. And as always, you can find me, YouTube.com slash Natalie Cuomo, at Natalie Cuomo on all platforms, Twitch.tv slash Natalie Cuomo. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next week.